Victory, we want to thank you so much for joining us here today. We're so excited to be able to gather together online with all of you, so welcome. We're starting a new series uh, today that's called What to Do When, which speaks directly to the evolving situation that we're experiencing right now. You know, the world has, has changed and it's left a lot of people doubtful and anxious and even afraid. So here in just a little bit, Josh is going to deliver an incredibly relevant message about how to look for certainty in uncertain times. As others continue to join us, we want to quickly go over what today's service is going to look like. So here in just a few moments, you'll have a chance to partner with us and what God is doing in our church and in our community through online giving. Then we're going to kick off with a couple of worship songs. We are super excited that we get a chance to worship with all of you through song now. Then we'll get to hear a relevant message from Josh and we'll take communion together. By the way, if you haven't prepared that ahead of time, be sure to do that now. And then we're going to wrap up with another song. Now, if you're joining us here, we want to know that you're here. So just like in our normal gatherings, we would ask that you please check in. We'll be posting a link down in the comment section for you to do so. Or of course, as always, you can check in on the Victory app if you have your phone handy. If you're watching on your phone, don't worry, you're gonna be able to do that after service as well. If you're a first time guest with us today, welcome and thanks for joining us. A link to our connection card is gonna be posted in the comment section. So please fill that out and we'll get back with you as soon as we can. We encourage you to download our Victory app if you haven't done that yet because it'll make your experience with us today even better. You can find our message notes, online giving, resources, and so much more on the Victory app. You may remember last week that we started talking about our Easter invite wall and we asked you to think of someone that you were praying to connect back to God by inviting them to Easter at Victory. And as you can see behind me here, a lot of you have already done that. You've sent in names for us to connect to the wall. Well, if you haven't done that yet or you'd like to submit more names, we're putting a link in the comments now. Our staff is going to be writing these names as they come in. We're praying for all of the names on the wall to be connected back to God, and we're putting them up here. So thanks so much for joining us today, Victory. We're glad you're here. At Victory, we don't just go to church. We are the church everywhere we go. And last week we had the opportunity to meet in hundreds of different locations all over the United States. And it was an incredible example of how the early church met. Because the early church, the first church, they didn't have a building. They met in homes all over. And, and, and now they probably didn't have live streaming, but, but they were sharing that because of Jesus, everyone could be connected back to God. And I wanna just thank you for inviting us into your home today or, or wherever you're listening, because this weekend, uh, we actually are on the radio, WYGB 100.3 FM for the very first time. So if you're listening, welcome to Victory. And last week when we met online, we were in over 1,400 uh, of your, your homes. You got to tune in. 
and I got to have breakfast with some of you, go on vacation with others of you, hang out in your small group. I mean, some of you got creative. You sent me pictures of you and me and your terrible cat. But the biggest thing I learned is that more of you should have worn pants. So, so last week when we met on Church Online, we were in Cincinnati, Ohio, El Paso, Texas, Montgomery, Alabama, Savannah, Georgia, Beaufort, South Carolina, South Dakota, and Florida. And we got to meet all over Indiana in Sellersburg and in French Lick and in Marion and in Seymour and in Edinburgh and in Bargersville and Danville and Belmont and Orleans and Needham. And we were in Plainfield and Greenwood in Columbus, and we were right here in Franklin, Indiana, just to name a few of the locations. Now, I just wanna welcome you, and we're so glad you've chosen to connect with us. Now, if you're watching this online, I would absolutely love to know who's watching and where you're watching from. So would you just post that in the comments right now? Now, even though we can't meet in a physical location uh, we, and, and be a church, we can be the church by encouraging each other in the comments. So instead of just sitting back and listening, I'd love for you to comment throughout the service. Also, if any part of the service was helpful to you, we would love to hear about it. We would love for you to comment, like, post, share, and invite people to watch uh, another airing of this service. And you would join us in our vision of connecting people back to God. Some of you have asked how you can partner with us financially now that we don't meet in a physical building. And I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for asking that. Your consistent generosity is absolutely critical for our success. Even though we won't be meeting here in the physical building for a while, our team has been working overtime to make sure that we can connect with you, uh, to figure out how to, how to best care for and encourage, uh, even equip and lead our kids, our students, and engage with you, our, maybe our adults. And if you haven't been to our social links or checked out what we're doing online, we're giving our, your kids some suggestions, devotions, or even distractions as you try to get some of your work done. Here, here's the reality, if you're not checking that out, you're missing out. But the very best way to partner with us as we navigate this new world together is by setting up a reoccurring gift through your bank or setting up a reoccurring gift on our app using uh, the, your checking account. And if that doesn't appeal to you, you can mail us uh, a check at 1720 North Graham Road, Franklin, Indiana, 46131. Now, last week, we shared with you our focus for the Easter offering, and it consisted in, in three parts. We we're partnering uh, in Frank, with Franklin Schools right now by raising money to feed hungry kids and families right in our community. It was just approved this last week that all of the kids would be covered by the state, so the money we raise will go to help feed the hungry families. We're also partnering with the police department to give them the tools that they need as they care for people on the very front lines of some of the darkest crimes in Franklin. Families of suicide victims and suicide attempts and child molestation, rape, sexual assault, child abuse, and child neglect. So once we fill those needs, a small portion of that offering will be used to help us create a better online experience. To which you might say, hey, this online thing is pretty great, but, but here's the reality. We don't have the tools that we currently need to, to do this uh, on a regular Sunday morning. And at Victory, we've always wanted to be on the front lines to fill needs and to, to meet people in the most desperate times in their life. And your consistent generosity is critical to making all of that possible. Uh, the good news is, is you can help us with this right now. You can be a part of what we're doing right now. Just visit our website, myvictorycc.life and click give online. And your generosity is changing lives forever uh, here in our community and around the world. And giving is just one of the ways that you and I have the opportunity to worship God. And I don't know what you're feeling in this moment of uncertainty, but this is a historic time. And things like panic, anxiety, and fear seem to be sold to us through the media outlets every single hour. But that's just part of the story. See, the whole world has gone crazy, but God is still in control. And for the next hour or so, we're going to remind ourselves about the whole story. That from our vantage point in history, we will see how our God makes a way when there is no way. And how He moves when we don't see any movement. That He is a miracle worker, a promise keeper, that He is a way maker. So don't just listen to part of the story. Realize that history testifies that our God can make a way when there is no way. So after you give, would you sing with us?
Hey, uh, thank you for joining us, uh, Victory Online. We're so glad that you're here worshiping with us. We're about to go into our worship set. We're so excited to be able to, to lead and sing and worship uh, as you might be in a car or you're at home. Wherever you might be, we encourage you to turn up the volume, uh, that you would uh, just be a part of these next few songs that we're going to sing, because I think uh, that the message uh, is, is, so, is so true. It's the gospel that, that, that just rings through these songs, and we're going to provide hope. We're going to provide joy in the midst of uncertainty in our world, uncertainty uh, maybe within our own families. And there's people are scared, and so these songs I, I, I pray would revive you and that would restore you, that you would have confidence in Christ because of what He's done and because of what He's doing. So I invite you to sing along. We're so excited uh, to have you guys here with us.
We are living in uncertain times. And in these uncertain times, we're all looking for certainty. Hourly, we have billion dollar industries shutting down for fear of a disease that there is no cure for. We are quarantining ourselves from our family and even our friends. There, there are no experts about our future or our country's future. What lies ahead for us and our health makes us anxious. What lies ahead for our economy makes us fearful. What lies ahead for our nation, it's simply unknown. And for some of us, this is only intensifying whatever struggles that we were already dealing with. In uncertain times, things like clarity and hope, they can be hard to come by. And so maybe you're listening today and, and you would say, like, I'm not really a church person or a God person. But no matter how different you and I might be, here's what we have in common. We are all looking for certainty. We're all looking for peace. We're all looking for a calm. We're all looking for something or someone to tell us everything is going to be okay. Or maybe like none of that applies to you. Maybe you're fine with what's going on in the world. And let's be honest, like introverts everywhere are finally excited. Like their life of social distancing is now socially acceptable. I mean, people who naturally deal with high anxiety or fear, they feel a little sense of relief because others actually know how they feel. Or maybe you're a hermit in a cabin in the middle of the woods and life for you, it hasn't changed at all. So maybe you're not currently struggling with uncertainty or anxiety or fear, but no matter how you've come into this moment, we all have this in common. That there will be a day, there will be a time, there will be an event uh, with that, that you can't seem to pray away, that you won't be able to faith it away. Like, no, you'll have to face it head on. And when that happens, you'll have to ask yourself, can I really do this? Can, can I really trust this? Am I up for the task? See, on certain times, they force us to wrestle with what we are placing our trust in. And no matter how different our beliefs might be, here's what we have in common. We're all trusting in something. Every single one of us, we're trusting in something. You and I can trust in a lot of things that you, you can trust in a relationship or you can trust in a company or your ability or your intellect. You can trust in your profession or your bank account, your grades or your skill or even your friends. Uh, even if the whole world shuts down, we, we can be trusting that that will come through for me. And that even if, the, even if you don't believe in God, we're all trusting in something and you owe it to yourself to know what that is. So, so what have you centered your life on? What have you leaned your life up against that on your darkest day, you're saying, I can depend on that will come through for me. See, if you follow Jesus, when we encounter uncertainty, when it creeps into our soul, I just, it really messes with you. Because it doesn't just hype up your anxiety and it doesn't just ramp up your fear. It actually causes you to question your faith. And you begin to wonder things like this. Is my trust in God real? Is my trust in God real? Can I trust my trust in God? A am I losing my faith? And if you've ever felt that way, I just want to say, me too. I've struggled with that too. No matter how you're hearing this, I want you to know you're not alone. In fact, when I was 24 years old, my wife Becky and I, we had some twins. Aren't they beautiful there? They, they were beautiful and they were born about a, a little over a month premature. And they, they were just awesome. But about three weeks after they were born, they contracted RSV. It's a respiratory infection that was dangerous for them to get, and especially since they were premature. They both got it. They both started losing weight. They both were struggling just simply to breathe. And Becky and I, we, we prayed for them to get better. Becky and I trusted that God was still in control, but guess what? They didn't get better. And so we rushed them to the hospital and I thought in the back of my mind, okay, we made it. The, the hospital, the people there, they will know what to do. They're going to keep my precious babies safe. And I felt that way until the nurses asked me to hold down my beautiful baby girl. And as they began to stick her with needles in her head and in her arm, I, I thought, okay, 
I, I can do this. So I held my little four pound baby girl down and she was screaming in pain and choking and gasping for air. And, and they couldn't get her the medicine that she needed. So they brought in three other people to hold her down to try to get her to take an IV. And for the next 45 minutes, which seemed like an eternity, they stuck my little baby girl eight times. Not one time did she get the medicine that she needed. And with every needle stick, there was more stress and more anxiety just filled my heart. And my, my prayers hadn't fixed it. The people I trusted to help her couldn't fix it. And my little girl is gasping for breath. And I was facing uncertainty. I was facing anxiety. I was facing a real fear. And when uncertainty creeps into your soul, you, you run these worst case scenarios in your head. I mean, you know what I'm talking about? Like you begin to think that what if, right? That, that scary question, what if, what if she can't be helped? What if she dies in my arm? What if, like what do I do then? What do I tell my wife? And when you get to that place as a Jesus follower, it's even scarier than that because it causes you to question your own faith. You begin to ask, like, is my trust in God even real? Does God know? Does God see? Does God even care? Is he even there? Can I trust my trust in God? And if you've ever wondered that, I'm going to say me too. I've struggled with that too. I had a moment. So you are not alone. No matter what you believe, there has been a time or there will be a time where you will ask, is my trust in God real? And if you feel comfortable in this moment, I'd love for you to post an example in the comments. And as you do that, I want you to realize you are not alone. See, this pandemic has only heightened our awareness that we actually have very little control of much of our lives. And you might be thinking, when will they stock the stores? When will they close down my job? When will they open up the church? Or what do I do when I run out of toilet paper? Like, do I use a shower curtain or an old sock? Like, it's just gross to even think about. But, but here's the deal. When we turn to the Bible for, for hope, you need to realize that, that these are not Bible people. These aren't super spiritual, super special people. They don't always get it right all of the time. These are people people. People like you and people like me who had uh, their own moments where they struggled. They had their own moments that they dealt with anxiety. They had their own moments where they questioned. In fact, we have a letter from the Apostle Paul sent to a young, successful preacher named Timothy who was wondering, can I trust my trust in God? Is my trust in God even real? And so if, you've, if you have your Bible, you want to turn to 2 Timothy and as you turn there, uh, 2 Timothy, I just could tell you a little bit about it. It was not written by Timothy. Like when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, they're all named after the authors. But 2 Timothy was actually written by a guy named Paul who hated Jesus. He hated Christians. He even killed Christians until he had a green eggs and ham moment, like with Jesus. Like he's like, I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam, I am. But then he met Jesus and goes, I do, I do like green eggs and ham. I like them, like them, Sam, I am. And he spread the life changing message of Jesus everywhere he went. He was committed the rest of his life to follow Jesus and tell the world about how, how they could have certainty that he had found in Jesus. But at the writing of, of this around 64 or six, to 67 AD, uh, he, Paul is nearing the end of his life. And he, he's in a terrible first century prison in Rome. That's where he is right there. And he knows his execution is coming, but he doesn't know when. His very last days are full of uncertainty. So he's writing his last letter to Timothy, who's like a son to him. And so Timothy is going to receive this letter and he's in his mid thirties and his church is all the way over here in Ephesus. Right, that, so he, 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 the church has grown significantly. And in fact, in ancient times, Ephesus was a destination city. And so think of like Las Vegas or LA or Miami or New York City. Like that was like the Ephesus of the day. So Ephesus was known for being a hub uh, of trade and activity. He was known for a wild living. And the church was established uh, all the way back in Paul's second missionary mission around 52 AD. Uh, and Timothy was there with Paul, but he was young. And Paul and Timothy were there for like two or three years. And then they moved on. For the next 10 years, a lot happens. Paul travels, Paul preaches, Paul even spends some time in prison all the way back in Rome. And when Paul gets out of prison, he and Timothy, they go all the way back to Ephesus 
again. And Paul leaves Timothy to lead that church in the middle of this crazy city. And under Timothy's leadership, I mean the church, it grew from hundreds to thousands. In fact, over 10,000 are recorded there uh, participating in ancient times. It was a massive uh, church for ancient times. And now Timothy is receiving this letter from his father of faith. Now, if you're listening online, uh, I, I want you to, 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 who do you look to? for a strong person of faith. I want you to share their name in the comments below. So, so Timothy is receiving this letter from his father of faith. This, this man he looks to for encouragement and for strength. He's about to die. So around 64 to 67 AD, Paul writes uh, this letter to Timothy. Now the reason Paul is writing this is because Timothy is in uncertain times himself. His church has grown so much that he can, no, he can no longer be ignored. The church was so large that government officials are thinking about killing him because his congregation has the size of, of an uprising. They could take over the government. Not only that, Timothy is getting pushback and criticism uh, and even debt threats from other church leaders. Because everyone, he's telling everyone that Jesus is the only way to God. That he's the only way to be right with God. And many of the church leaders, they were trying to control and manipulate the people by convincing everyone that Jesus was not enough. That you have to try harder. That you have to do better. That you have to get your life right. And you have to stay right to be right with God. And so the big churches, they started to say, hey, the big church down the road that Timothy's preaching at, they're all about attracting people. So they're, they're, they are too forgiving. <laughs> they're too understanding. Sinners go there. And so, so that's how they get so many people. He doesn't even teach the Bible. They aren't true Christians like we are. Timothy, he's a heretic. Now, back then when you didn't like someone, you didn't just talk bad about them. Even religious leaders would look for a way to take them out. And so Timothy was viewed as su successful. But things didn't get better for Timothy, even though he was successful. Life isn't easier. Due to his success, things got worse and his life got even more uncertain. Now, Timothy is a target in one of the greatest metropolitan cities of the ancient world. And the government doesn't like him. The religious leaders don't like him, which is kind of crazy if you think about it. For the last seven years, all he's done is focus on doing the right thing, being the right person, leading with integrity. But uncertainty has hit his life. Now, from the tone of this letter, you discover Timothy is doubting himself and even doubting his faith. And as a leader of this church, he's faced with a life-shaking question. Is my trust in God, is it even real? If you've ever asked yourself that question, a pastor of a megachurch in ancient times, he was there for seven years, someone who was in the Bible could say, me too. I struggle too. You're not alone. And so Paul, his mentor, writes to him from somewhere in Rome in a prison awaiting his own execution about how to have certainty in uncertain times. I'm telling you, these words are so, so, so important because I don't know if you've noticed, but panic is contagious. Like, ha have you sensed that over the last few weeks as you've watched the news? Panic is contagious, but so is faith. So here's some of the last words recorded, last recorded words of the Apostle Paul. It says this, he says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. So Tim, I know you're anxious. I know you're struggling. I'm not downplaying any of that struggle. I agree that your life is tough right now. But in the midst of all of this, don't forget about what? God's promise. Don't, don't forget about God's promise. And now why would he say that? Well, here's why I believe he said that. Because the foundation of certainty is, in uncertain times is God's promise. So Tim, I want you to remember God's promise. It's bigger than your perspective. Tim, you can't trust your perspective. Tim, you didn't even see this coming anyway. So, so from your vantage point, Tim, you have no idea what's next. That means you can't trust your perspective. In some of Paul's last recorded words, he says, no matter what happens to you, no matter what comes at you, your faith isn't based on what you see. No, your faith is based on who God is. And Timothy... Don't trust your perspective. Put your faith, your trust, your life in God's promise. Why? Because that's the only solid foundation. Now, when you look at, at verse 2, I want you to sense how, how, how bad he wants him to, to understand this. He says to Timothy, my dear son. And this is what he wants you to feel. I want you to feel grace, mercy, and peace from the God the Father and Christ Jesus our, our Lord. 
And I, want, I, I thank God in whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. You think you're alone? You're not alone. I am praying for you recalling, and I recalling your tears as I long to see you that I might be filled with joy. Now when the last time that they met, they had this sense, he and Timothy, that they would never actually see each other alive again. And so when they left, Paul's saying, hey, hey we, we both cried in that moment. And so Paul is saying, hey, Timothy, I know there's uncertainty, has rocked your faith, but I want you to look at what he points to. Look at this in verse 5. He says, I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and, and in your mother Eunice. Now, if you're listening online, I mean, those, aren't those great names? So if, if you're, there's a Lois or a Eunice out there, I'd love for you to, to show us in the comments. But, but here, so Paul is saying, I, I know that you're struggling in uncertain times, but I want you to remember your grandma. I want you to remember her faith. And don't forget about your mama's faith. Now, now you need to realize that this is not really popular language. Uh, all the other ancient literature would have said, hey, Timothy, I want you to remember your father. I, I, you need to remember your, your grandfather's great faith. Because in ancient times, uh, women were not considered to be equal to men. But Jesus brought value to every human being, every person with a heartbeat. And so, so I want to give a shout out to all of the godly women who are examples of faith for us. Uh, those of you who are watching online, if you want to share the name of a woman who's impacted your faith, we would absolutely love to, to encourage them. So just do that right now in the comments. So in this moment of uncertainty, Paul tells Timothy, hey, I want you to remember your grandma. Don't forget about your mama's faith. Paul, a man who is about to get his head chopped off for his faith uh, is saying, hey, I know panic is contagious. All right, but so is faith. So Timmy, you caught your faith from your mama. You caught your faith through your grandmama. Like it, it first lived through them and, and their faith. It, it's contagious and, and it, it's taking root in your life. But, but here's the important part. He says, I, I am persuaded that that faith now lives in you also. Now, how, how many of you know, if, if there's anyone who's going to tell you the truth, it's a dead man walking. And Paul says, I know you're questioning your faith, but, but don't give up. I see it. In you. And because that's inside of you, and I know it's real, and I believe that you have faith to faith to faith. Right? When uncertainty creeps into your soul, it causes you to question your faith. You begin to say, Is my trust in God, is it even real? And you might be tempted to think that those doubts actually mean that you don't really have faith. But what we learn from Scripture is, is doubt is not the enemy of faith. Right? That's, that's not, doubt is not the enemy of faith. I mean, we think if we have doubts, then I can't have faith. Uh, if, if there's uncertainty, if there's fear, if we have uh, this sense of anxiety, we must not really have faith. But I got news for you. Doubt is not the enemy of faith. Certainty is. Why? Well, because when, when you are certain, you don't even need faith. Because you have certainty. I mean, get this. Just think about it this way. We won't need faith in heaven. We won't need any faith in heaven. Think about it. Like, well, like, where's God? He's like, he's right over there. Like, there's going to be no faith in heaven. So doubt is not the enemy of faith. Certainty it is. And so Paul says, Timothy, just because you're uncertain, just because it's crept into your soul, it doesn't mean that you've really lost faith. If you're wondering, does my doubt, does my anxiety, does my fear in uncertain times, is that, does that mean that my trust in God isn't real? Like, does that mean my faith isn't real? Well, hey, you're in good company. A man who was a leader of one of the largest churches in antiquity says, me too. I've wrestled with that too. So I want to say to you the very same thing Paul said to Timothy when it comes to your faith. It's real. I see it in you. I, it, it's, it's there. It's right there. Even the fact that you took the time to log in today means that you're taking steps towards real, live, faith to faith to faith. So if you scroll through social media, you, you know that panic is contagious, right? You already know that, but there's good news. So is faith, and I see your faith. So imagine you, you come to me and you're like, you're all distraught. You're like, Josh, is my trust in God even real? Like, and I lock eyes with you. And I, I, I just, I, I want you to know, like, with all my sincerity, it's real. I see it in you. You are a man of faith. You are a woman of faith. People will look to you as a person of faith. I believe that God's promises are bigger than your perspective. I believe in you. I see your faith. And you get so emotional. And you're like, really? Really? You can see it in me? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. Our conversation is proof that you're taking steps of faith. And you're like wiping your nose. It's like, okay. So like, 
what do I do next? And, and what I say next might, might shock you. Like, you might think that if I was going to tell you to do something next, like, okay, you need to create a, a self-quarantine with just you and God. You need to get away with, with, from all of the haters. You need to, like, find a seclu secluded place and pray more. But that's not what Paul says. I want you to look. He says, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you. So are you struggling with uncertainty? Yeah. Well, then you need to use the gift of God's, uh, the, that God's given you to help others. To which you're like, what kind of advice is that? I'm struggling. Like, we're talking about my faith. We're talking about my fear. We're talking about my anxiety and my uncertainty. Like, I need encouragement to which I go, yeah, I know. Isn't it awesome? Like, you should go encourage other people. Like, how frustrated would you be if that was the advice I actually gave you? You'd be telling your friends, hey, I talked to this guy, Josh. He's kind of a jerk. Like, he says some really nice stuff to me. And then he expects me to go do stuff, like go serve humanity. Like, I can't believe it. But Paul, a dead man walking, tells Timothy, in uncertain times, God has uniquely gifted you. Which leads me to ask you this question. How has God gifted you? How has God gifted you? As a nation, we face uncertainty. And we don't know what will happen. And, and, and when that happens, we are all prone to push ourselves into isolation. When we're scared about the future, we're all prone to adopt a scarcity mindset. When we don't know what's next, we, we let our perspectives impact our faith in God. Every natural human tendency throws us into protection mode. It throws us into isolation mode. And Paul says, no, 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 you got the faith. Now, now go use your God-given abilities to serve others. Now, I'm wondering, like, why would he tell us to do that? Well, I believe it's because of this. Fear fears community. Fear fears community. In uncertain times, the very worst thing you could do is isolate yourself. In uncertain times, the very worst thing you could do is let your mind spiral out of control as you just cycle through the news. The very worst thing you could do is quarantine yourself with your own fears. You know why? You'll drive yourself crazy because fear grows in isolation, but fear fears community. That's true. And so Paul says, I, I, I remind you to fan into the flame the gift of God, which is in you. So I want you to fan the flames, get some matches, set your gift on fire. Now, the problem with that is we think Paul should have tried harder. Like, it's like, hey, Paul, could you have done anything to like inspire them to something bigger? Like, could you do anything to, to get that close feeling back to God? Don't you think that we should get that love and feeling back first? But on certain times, there's nothing better that you can do than seeing God work through you. Now, what's interesting, I don't know if you caught this or not, but when you go back and look at that verse, when Paul tells Timmy to use his gift, he just, it's singular. Like you got one gift. It's like, Tim, I'm sorry to tell you this, but you need to use your, your gift, the only gift that you got, but, but, I'm, but you need to, to use it. And now you might ask, like, what gift do I have? Well, in another letter Paul writes in, in Romans, he lists a lot of gifts. And so he basically says, hey, are you good at teaching people about God? Then you need to go and do that. Are you good at serving others? Then you need to find a way to serve. If you're and good at encouraging others, then what are you waiting for? Encourage people right now. In fact, one of the gifts that Paul lists is, is giving money away. Did you realize that God could give you the gift of giving money away? That you see a need and with your generosity, you actually change Live. So I'm like, leads me to ask, like, how has God gifted you? Fan that flame. See, the whole world is looking for answers. The whole world is looking for certainty. But in uncertain times, there's nothing better you can do than seeing God work through you. You are the answer to someone else's prayer request. I mean, I, I need you to know, social distancing does not mean that you can't call. It doesn't mean that you can't FaceTime somebody. It doesn't mean that you can't encourage. You can be on quarantine. You can be in lockdown and still show love to your friends and your neighbors. You can provide money to help hungry families right here in our community. You see, in a certain time, we are the answer to everyone else's prayer request. And so no matter how uncertain you may, might feel, I want to encourage you to use your gift. Why? Because fear, it fears community. Now, I don't know what the future holds. From our limited perspective, there's, very, there's so much that's unknown. There's so much fear. There, there's a lot of uncertainty. But faith doesn't mean that you don't get afraid. No, faith means that you don't let fear stop you. Instead of maybe uh, feeding your fear and uncertainty, you can fan into flames your gift. 
Now, we're, we're not meeting in a physical location, but now is an opportunity for you to be the church everywhere you go. You can be the church in your Google Classrooms. You can be the church in your home or in your office or on conference call, calls. And when you do that, you are giving certainty in uncertain times to everyone around you. And when you, you ask, what does love require of me? I'm just telling you. It looks a lot less like fearful self-preservation and it looks a lot more like servant leadership. To which you might say, Josh, what about the virus? I'm not telling you to be unwise. I mean, you can serve others and, and, and still be on lockdown. I just don't want fear to stop you. I don't want fear to isolate you. I don't want fear to consume you because you, you know this fear, fierce community. So, so I want you to look at what Paul says next. He says, for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but it gives us power and love and self-discipline. And maybe you've grown up reading this verse before, but if you grew up in church, you probably heard it this way. It says, for God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but out of power and love and self-control. Do you know what that means? That if you have fear, it's not from God. The, the, the word spirit right there, it actually implies that God does not give you the spirit of fear. That God never leads you by fear. That God never leverage, leverages terror deep in your soul. That in the middle of uncertainty, if you sense any of that, it's not God. And so no matter how much you pray, there will be a day. There will be a time. There will be a, an event that causes you to question, is my trust, is my faith in God, is it even real? Can I trust my trust in God? There will be a day that every single one of us will have to face our fear. But Paul wanted you to know before he got his head cut off that God does not send fear. So if you sense any of that, it's not from God. No, he sends power and love and self-control. That's from God. So Paul wanted you to know that if you follow Jesus, fear is not what moves us. Uncertainty is not what moves us. It is going to be our faith that actually moves us. That God is sending you self-control to control your fear. That God is giving you the power over your doubts. That God is sending his, his love right to you. See, fear and faith, they can't occupy the same space. They just can't in our life. And I see faith in you. See, we're all trusting in something. We're all faithing in something. And the good news is, is you get to decide what you're trusting in. You get to decide where you place your faith. And even if the whole world shuts down, God's still in control. He is. Even if everything gets shut down, God is still in control. And so Paul, as he wraps up this section of scripture, he wants you to know the world sees things from a limited perspective. Don't, don't you know that? And so he says, so don't, do not be ashamed of my, the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. And so Timothy I, if you're going to look at my life from a limited perspective, here's what you're going to feel. Ashamed. You're going to be scared that you might be a prisoner. You might be uh, uh, nervous that you're going to have to suffer. So Timothy, I don't want you to filter your life from your limited perspective. You, if you do that, your faith, it won't hold up because it looks bad. From your perspective, I'm telling you, life looks bleak. So you'll be secluded and you'll feel all alone. So Paul wants Timothy to know, hey, I want to give you another filter to look through. Look at what he says in verse 9. He says, but he, meaning God, has saved us and he has called us to a holy life. Not because of anything that we've done, but because of his own purpose and grace. That our standing with God has never depended on what we've done, but who we've trusted in. He says, but because of his own purpose and grace, this grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. The whole time this has been a part of God's plan. But it has now uh, been revealed through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality. I mean, that's amazing. Do you realize what we're preaching here? We're preaching immortality. That, that you can access this gift of immortality that you don't have to be afraid to even die. God promises that if we die, we can still live forever. That Jesus gave us victory even over death. And so Paul is writing to Timothy to remind him, hey, don't you dare stop telling people that, that, that the, anyone and everyone can be forgiven. Timothy, don't you do dare stop telling every, everyone that anyone and everyone can, can find peace. Don't you dare stop telling anyone and everyone that they can have certainty in uncertain times. Anyone and everyone can be connected back to God. Not based on what they've done, but what Jesus has done. What Jesus has connected us to. So Timothy, don't you dare trust in your perspective. Filter your life through God's 
promises. You see, here's the reality. Like there's this cup of dirty water, that, lake water that I have here, and it represents your life. And I know for a fact, like what, what we're looking at here, it's bad. Uh, you don't need a magnifying glass to know that there's some bad stuff swimming around in this cup. And if I were to drink this right now, I'm certain I would get some parasites, some bacteria. That is why we have to learn to filter our life through something different. What if you decided that I'm not going to trust my limited perspective? What if you said, I'm not going to trust my limited perspective? You say, why would I do that? Because I, you, you know from experience that you have a limited perspective. I mean, if, if you really could see everything, you would have stocked on toilet paper a long time ago. Like, so, so what if you decided, I'm not going to trust my limited perspective? What if you decided to filter whatever your uncertainty that you're facing was through God's promise? See, we all have a limited perspective. We all get to choose our filter. Now, this right here is a, a life straw. And uh, if you're ever in the woods, this could save your life because it filters out 99% of all the dangerous stuff in the water. And so this lake water, it would hurt you if you drank it straight. Uh, but, but the moment I use this, this stuff. So what's the point? It's not about what happens to you. It's how you filter it. It's not about what you face. It's, about, it's not about the, the what ifs. There's going to be bad stuff in your life. The point is, is choosing the right filter. There was good water in there and we need something that we can filter our life through. I just want to tell you, yeah, it looks hard. Yeah, what's in front of us? It looks kind of bleak. It might be even terrible, but with the right filter, you can bring something good out of it. There can be a beauty in the midst of all of that bad. There is a platform maybe that God is building right now in the midst of your pain that all you need is the right filter. Do you know why the church that Jesus built has survived plagues and wars and pandemics and the dark ages and the renaissance and anything and everything in between? It's because they filtered their whole lives through God's promise. That was their foundation. In fact, when we celebrate communion at the, at the end of this message, we're centering our lives on that promise. We're filtering our lives through that promise. When what is in front of you seems impossible, our, our God can, can take what the enemy meant for evil and he can turn it around for good. God used the death of his son so that, uh, that you and I might have immortality that you don't have to fear death anymore. God sent his son to die in your place so that you and I, that we might be able to find victory. And if God loves you that much, if God would sacrifice the life of his own son, then what would he hold back from you? I mean, how long will you attach God's love or God's care or God's concern or God's deep care for you? How long will you attach that to your limited perspective? I mean, what if you filtered your whole life through his faithfulness? What if you filtered your whole life through his track record? What if you filtered your whole life through his promise? You see, it says Christ Jesus has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality. See, as we prepare our hearts for communion, would you remember the body and the blood of Jesus is proof that you can have certainty in uncertain times, that you could know and that you could sense and you, that you could feel that God knows that God sees and that God really does care for you. And as you take the communion juice, as it washes down your throat, I want the peace of God to wash over you. And do you know that the most frequent command in scripture, I, there's lots of commands. You think, okay, was well, it be good? I mean, is that the most frequent command? Is it be holy? Is that maybe the most frequent command or, or don't sin or do good works? No, 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 no. The, the most frequent command in scripture is fear not. It's, it's, it's fear, it's fear not. And so 365 times God says, do not be afraid, one for every day of the week. So as you take communion, may you have this deep sense that even though what we face ahead of us is gonna be difficult, we can have certainty in uncertain times because there is victory in Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you that you've given us these emblems of the, the body and the juice to remind us of your sacrifice, that may we center our life on your promise, that we know just because of from our perspective of history that you go with us, that you are for us, and that you can turn even terrible things into good in our life. 
And so as we take this communion right now, Father, I pray that you would wash over us this deep sense of care and concern and deep knowing that we can live differently, that we can be a light in the world, that we can be certainty in the midst of uncertainty because of Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Victory
message and a great reminder of how we can still have certainty even when things around us feel uncertain. We want to thank you all for tuning in with us today. If this message helped you and you're watching on Facebook right now, please consider sharing it with others by sharing it to your page or you can tag someone's name in the comments. If you'd like to continue the conversation or you'd like any additional information about this message or about victory in general, or if you'd simply like someone to pray with you or for you, please text the word next to 317-576-2288 and someone on our Next Steps team will connect with you. All right, Victory, it's time to go and be the church. We'll see you here for Victory Online next weekend. Have a great week.